I would just mention, you know, I noticed how many children there were up here for the children's story. And we have a few more children up here than we actually have in school. I'll let you draw your conclusions from that. But again, I know, you know, Christian education is expensive. And yet, you know, I also believe that there's not anybody that will get to the kingdom of heaven and say, you know, I invested too much money in trying to see people here. I will also mention, you know, with Steve, we've both been here 12 years, and I think, and he slipped out, but I think I can honestly say there's not one student that wanted to come to the school that the church hasn't been willing to say, you know, we'll work with you, we'll help you, that there's not one student who can honestly say, well, I couldn't come because I couldn't afford it. This church has been supportive. And, you know, if we get more students than we can afford, I don't mind coming up here and begging for money Amen. for that cause. Some, no, I wouldn't want to do, but for that, I'll be happy to come up here and, you know, say, hey, we've got kids that want to be in our school and can't afford it. Can you help? Anyway, let's bow our heads together. Our gracious Father, how thankful we are for your love, for your grace, for all that we have in Jesus. And as we take a few moments to open your word, we ask that you would open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, that we would see Jesus, that we would be drawn to him, is our prayer in his name. Amen. rest. You hear the word, what comes to mind? What's the first thing you think of? Probably for a lot, sleep. Maybe some of you being Sabbath, think of a Sabbath afternoon nap. You know, when I get home, I'm going to eat, have a nice meal, maybe stay for the fellowship meal. Now, I realize it's possible there may even be some of you here right now that are going to get a head start on that and take a little snooze during the sermon. I'm sure it will be totally accidental, you know, and it's something you don't want to do, but, you know, just, well, we understand. But again, different things. When you think of rest, do you think of activity? You know, there are activities we do that provide rest, that re-energize us. Maybe you think of inactivity, you know, sleeping. Well, maybe dreaming, that's, I guess, activity, but um, different things. But how do you find rest? Do you have something you do when you know you're stressed, etc., that you can do that will bring you rest, that will bring you peace, that will take away your stress and your anxiety? How would you define it? It's interesting. I looked in the dictionary, a couple of them, Merriam-Webster, and I didn't write all of them, just the ones that kind of hit me appropriate for what we're doing this morning. A place for resting or lodging. You know, there are some places that just aren't restful. Some that are. I like this one. Peace of mind or spirit. Do you have peace of mind, of spirit? You know, I think of the verse in Isaiah, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose what? Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. something used for support, something we can rest on. You know, sometimes that's something literal that we have, maybe figuratively a person that we rest on that gives us comfort, that gives us strength, that gives us peace of mind or spirit. There was also a little section that talked about being at rest and a couple of things there, but one in particular, free of anxiety. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand, although it probably wouldn't be too embarrassing, if I ask you how many of you came to church this morning and can say you're free of anxieties. You have no anxieties whatsoever. Well, Pastor, that's not realistic. Oh? Now, I realize there are legitimate and valid concerns we need to pray about, we need to put in God's hands. But, you know, the Bible does say be anxious for nothing. Do you have a place where you can find rest? 
in dictionary.com. It had it just a little different. Relief or freedom, especially from anything that wearies, troubles, or disturbs. Mental or spiritual calm, tranquility. Again, do you have a place where you can find rest? Do you have something you do that brings you rest? You know, we can think of it outside of the spiritual context. Maybe there are things that you do. You know, maybe for some of us, it's sports. Whether you like it or don't or what. You know, for some, that's a relaxing thing to kind of get rid of our stress, our anxiety. Maybe for some, it's shopping. You know, I remember, you know, my mother, I don't know how many times we had discussions about she didn't understand how I could spend time watching a sporting event. And I would remind her that I didn't understand how she could spend so much time shopping. You know, and she finally, you know, she said, well, it relaxes me. You know, it's something that I enjoy that's relaxing. And I said, well, that's why I do what I do. We have different ways, maybe good, maybe not so good, but we have different ways we try it. Maybe it's reading, especially if it's something good and wholesome. Maybe it's music. You know, it's amazing what a song can do to the heart, to the mind. What do you have that helps you have mental or spiritual calm, tranquility? Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight summed it up well. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. Ultimately, I don't care what it is you're doing. If you're trying to find real rest, there is only one place you will ever find it because there is only one person who can truly give it to you, and that is Jesus. Now, I'm not saying, you know, there's nothing else, you no other activity that is valid or legit. But ultimately, true rest will only be found in Jesus. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Rest. It can only be found in Jesus. Coming to Him with all of your concerns, your anxieties, your stress, whatever it is, are you willing to bring it and leave it at the feet of Jesus? Do you bring everything in your life to Jesus? Everything, whatever it is, do you trust Him to deal with it in the way that is ultimately, well, you know, I don't know, I, I did, but you know, I really wasn't happy with the way He handled some things. I mean, let's be honest, we've all thought that, haven't we? You know, something we've prayed about, we've asked God to do what is best, and then he does something that, well, it just doesn't seem like the best option to us. You know, I do believe what one person said a long time ago. If we could see the end from the beginning, we wouldn't want it any other way. There's a reason the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. I need to trust him, and that's not always easy. Do you want rest? Do you want peace? Do you want spiritual calm? Do you want that which Jesus had? Are you willing to place everything in his hands as he was willing to place everything in his Father's hands? Many of you have probably seen this little poem, Let Go and Let God. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I snatched them back and cried, How can you be so slow? My child, he said, What could I do? You never did let go. I wonder, what is it we've asked God to deal with, and then we keep trying to help Him? Now, don't misunderstand me. There are ways we're to help God, but I need to help God where God has asked me to help. Not tell God how to do it my way, and, you know, and, well, God, I don't think you're doing it quite right. You know, you ought to do it a little different. Am I willing to do things God's way and only His way? God is the only source of rest. Do you trust Him? 
I mean, it's easy. We'd all raise our hands and say yes. But do you really trust him? Do you trust him with everything? Do you trust him with your life? Do you trust him with your career, with your family? Do you trust him with your joys, with your sorrows? You know, it is interesting in the Bible. Where is the first time the concept of rest comes? It is in Genesis. Not in the first chapter where God creates everything, the first, second, third, fourth. It's Genesis chapter 2. God is the first one to rest right there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were what? Finished. You see, folks, the only way I'll find rest is in what God has finished, what God has done. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and what? Sanctified it, made it holy, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Rest starts with creation. It starts with the creator. It is God who first rested. He rested from the work of creation he gave us a day of rest, a day of rest before there was any sin, before there was any of the issues that we have to deal with today. God gave us a day of rest. You know, if it was good for Adam and Eve before sin, do you think it's important for us today? If Adam and Eve in a perfect created world needed a day of rest, how much more do us in this world of sin need a day of rest? It is a day to remember our Creator. A day to remember who we are, where we came from. We were created in the image of God. We were created to be like Him. Are you resting in God's work? Are you really resting in what God is doing, has done, will do? Are you completely resting in His work? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, one of my favorite verses. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has what? Begun a good work in you will what? Complete it until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, who is it that started the good work in your life? Jesus. Who is it that will complete it? What is my role in this good work? To allow him to continue to work. At any time, do I have the right to say, God, you know, I'm ready to take it on from here. Thank you for getting me this far. I can handle it now. You know, it's Mother's Day. I don't want to get in trouble. But, you know, how many moms did you, you know, you were trying to help your children do something, and they said, I can do it, Mom. I don't need your help anymore. Did it generally work well when they did that? Eh, not so much. How often do we say, God, you know, thank you for your help so far, but I can handle it from here. And then we wonder why we don't have peace, why we don't have rest, because we don't allow God to finish what he has started. Only he can start it, only he can finish it. But I have a choice. I can cooperate or I can choose not to cooperate. Do you believe that God can finish what he started? Do you believe your creator can restore his image in you? The Sabbath is a reminder of what God can do. Only God can make anything or anyone holy. Nothing I do will ever make me holy. Only God can make a day and only God can make a person holy. The Sabbath is a reminder of the plan of redemption. Ironically, it was there before redemption was needed, but it is a reminder of God's redemptive power that he can restore, that he can change me back into his image. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 and verse 20. More also I gave them my Sabbath to be assigned to 
between them and me that they may know that I am the Lord who what? Where did we just hear that word? In Genesis chapter 2, God did what to the Sabbath? He sanctified it. He made it holy. God is the only one that can make a day holy. God is the only one that can make you holy. The Sabbath is a sign, a reminder of how I become holy, how I am transformed from a sinner to a saint saved by grace. Verse 20, the same chapter. Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us, that you will know that what? I am the Lord your God. Now, folks, I want to be careful. I realize there's people in different points in their growth in their relationship with God. But it is interesting, Ezekiel says the Sabbath is a sign what? That the Lord is our God. If I reject the Sabbath, what am I really saying according to this verse? God, you're not my God. You may be somebody, but you're not my... It is a reminder. It is a sign of my relationship with God that I belong to Him that he is mine and I am his. Do you need a sign? Do you need a reminder? You know, I've learned as I'm getting older, I need a lot more reminders. A lot more than I used to need. But we need them. Sometimes we need a reminder of where we're going. Sometimes we need a reminder there is only one way to get there. Even if I know where I'm going, there is only one way. Jesus puts it very simply. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Jesus. The Sabbath is a reminder. It is a reminder of who Jesus is. It is a reminder of what Jesus has done, that he is our creator, that he who made a day holy is the only one who can make me holy. Do you need Sabbath rest? Are you resting in His works? Resting in His righteousness. Sabbath rest is resting in His forgiveness. It is to rest in His grace. It is to rest in His love. It is to rest in His salvation. Do you want to enter into His rest? You know, it's a sad commentary, but we know the story of the children of Israel. It was one rebellion to another, wasn't it? I mean, there were some nice stretches in there where they were faithful, where they were true, and God blessed them abundantly, but for the most part, it was pretty quick, out of sight, out of mind, wasn't it? With a few nice exceptions... The children of Israel failed to enter into his rest. And my friends, I hope I'm wrong here, but I'm afraid that sadly most Christians have never entered into that rest either. Hebrews talks about it. We're going to read a number of verses here. Part of it leading up. Part of it, the, the author of Hebrews is talking about Psalms. He's quoting it. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will, what? Hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said to them, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, you know, there's finally a point where God says I've had enough, right? Is that really what the wrath of God is really about? Or is the wrath of God when God says, okay, I'll give you what you want? As much as I know it's not what you need, it's not good for you, I will respect your free will. If you don't want me to lead in your life, I'll let you go your own way. 
may I suggest that is the wrath of God. When it, God painfully, sorrowfully says, okay, I'll give you what you want. The wrath of God, when the end comes, is when God abandons his children. If you remember, Jesus, the one person who has suffered the wrath of God, what was his cry upon the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I don't know, I hope, none of you as parents have had to forsake your children. I can't imagine the pain for God in the end when he finally has to give the lost what they want. And he says, I will forever remove my spirit. I will forever leave you alone. I will never bother you again. And when God removes his present, his spirit, just as Jesus died on the cross, the wicked, the lost will be dead forever. Sadly, they shall not, not because God didn't want them to, but because they refused over and over again. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In what? Who is it that departed from the living? Did God depart from his people? No, they departed from him. God never leaves us, but we can leave God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. May I paraphrase a little bit with another verse that we looked at. If we allow him who has begun working in us to finish what he started... That is the only way that I will go from beginning to end, by the grace of God. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom he was angry forty years, was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom he did swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. I probably should have put it on the screen, but, you know, I mentioned that passage in Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in what? Perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts. Are you living a life of trust or a life of unbelief? You will never enter into God's rest if you do not believe in him, if you do not trust him with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength. Entering into God's rest. Why is it that Israel failed to enter into God's rest? A number of things mentioned there in the passage we just read. It was hard-heartedness. Anybody here have a hard heart? Maybe today we'd call it hard-headedness. Rebellion. You know, it's easy to point our finger at some other people who we know aren't doing what they should be. But is there rebellion in my heart? Is there something God has asked me to do? And, you know, well, I just don't think I ought to have to do that, God. I could probably give some examples. I'll just move on. Is there an evil heart of unbelief? You know, where did sin start, folks? It started when Satan stopped believing what God said. It started on planet Earth when Adam and Eve chose not to believe what God said. It never ends well when we don't believe what God says. It leads to departing from the living God because you see, if I don't believe God, it's only natural that I'm going to leave him behind. I'm not going to follow somebody I don't believe in. You know, we don't tend to do that, do we? Disobedience. 
What is keeping us today from entering into God's rest? Do we have the same problems today? It would be nice if we could just point back to the children of Israel and say, you know, well, that's their problem, but we're different today. No, I'm sorry, we're not. We can be by the grace of God. We need to be. But as a whole, sadly, it's not much different. He continues talking to the new church. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as what? As well as to... You mean the gospel was preached in the Old Testament? Yeah, it was. It hasn't changed. God's method of salvation has been the same from the moment Adam and Eve sinned until all sin is forever removed from God's universe. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith. Folks, I can read this Bible from cover to cover, and I can memorize every... Well, actually, probably I can't memorize every... I don't know if my memory's that... But even if I did, if it's not mixed with faith, does it do me any good? Folks, there's nobody that knows this book better than the devil. It doesn't do him any good because it's not mixed with faith. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do not enter that rest, as he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. When was God's rest made sure? creation and the foundation of the world. It was not an afterthought. God did not, oops, you know, I missed it. I better come up with a plan B. God always had one. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from what? All his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. A word that's not real popular anymore. And on one sense it shouldn't be popular, but that's another issue. We better move on. And again he designates a certain day, saying in David, today... After such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will, what? Hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. You see, I can hear the voice, and I can harden my heart. I can hear God speak to me and say, you know, no, I don't want to do that. The truth is, folks, but for the grace of God, the only way I will respond to his voice is to harden my heart. But God has offered me a new heart, a new spirit. God has offered to change my heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There therefore remains a rest for who? For the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also what? Cease from his works as God did from his. So that means if I accept Christ, I do nothing. No, it means I cease from my works. Because my works, my righteousness is like a filthy rag. And I put my faith in what God has done. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Are you being diligent to enter into God's rest, to be faithful to Him, to trust in His works instead of your own Sabbath rest? Do you want to enter it? Do you want to experience it? You see, it requires obedience. 
Again, not a popular term today in this society. Well, you know, I just have my own truth and you have yours. Have you heard that phrase? I'm just trying to live my truth. Folks, let me tell you, if it's not this truth, you're trying to live your lie instead of somebody else's lie. There's only one truth. That's here. But the devil's done a good job of convincing everybody, you know, it's all relative. You decide what's right, and I'll decide what's right for me. It requires obedience, but obedience only comes by faith. Are you living by faith? It started a reformation just over 500 years ago. That little verse, the just shall live by faith. And as Martin Luther is going up that staircase, he remembers and everything changes. And yet something's happened in that reformation because we're still here. We haven't really learned to live by faith, have we? Because if we had, I don't believe we'd still be here. Are you living by faith? By faith in your Creator? By faith in your Redeemer? Are you resting in what Jesus has done? In what Jesus is doing? In what Jesus has promised to do? Can you in sincerity of heart pray like Jesus, not my will, but your will be done? Nothing wrong with asking God for what you want. Jesus asked, this cup can pass. Nothing wrong when you're facing trials to say, God, I don't want to go through this. But I want to be like Jesus and say, not my will, but your will be done. God, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have to face it. I don't know if I can. Not my will, but your will be done. Is your life totally surrendered to Jesus as his life was totally surrendered to his Father? Can you say like Jesus, I of my own self can do nothing? I mean, we can say it. It's easy. The words roll right out. But in my life, am I trying to do it myself? Or do I realize my total dependence upon Jesus? Are you living by faith in Jesus alone? Are you trying to find rest in yourself, in something in the world? I mean, the devil will tell you all sorts of ways you can find it, but he's a liar and the father of lies. Are you trying to find it in your own works, in your own righteousness, in what you do or don't do? Paul talked about the problem with his own people, with the Jews. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Is there anything wrong with having zeal for God? No, we ought to have it. What is the problem with their zeal? But not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Does that sound a little bit like what the psalmist, what Hebrews was talking about, about those who would not enter into God's rest because of unbelief? For Christ is the end of the law, period. I thought I'd get a little reaction out of that. You know, that's where a lot of people start, isn't it? Christ is the end of the law. It's done. It's over. It's gone. It's not what the Bible says, is it? For Christ is the end of the law for what? For righteousness. So see, the law is not really right. No, that's not what it says either. There's a purpose of the law, just like there's a purpose for a mirror. The mirror shows me what my condition is. Do you have a mirror that can fix it when you got a smudge on your face? You know, if you got that mirror, I'd like to get one. All the mirror can do is tell you your condition. The law tells you what righteousness is, and when I look in that mirror, when I look in that law, I see what I'm not, that I am not righteous. 
For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Believes, who lives by faith. The law tells me my condition. Jesus is the solution to my condition. Jesus is the one who has lived the law perfectly. Jesus is the one who the law reflects his character. God's righteousness. Do you understand it? Have you accepted it? Have you accepted it as your only hope? Are you trying to establish your own righteousness? You know, maybe some of us even as Seventh-day Adventists are trying to establish it by keeping the Sabbath. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm in favor of keeping the Sabbath holy. The Bible says we should. We need to do that. But keeping the Sabbath holy doesn't make me righteous. Having the righteousness of Christ in my heart makes it possible for me to keep the Sabbath holy because Christ is living out his life in me. That is the only way I will ever keep the Sabbath holy. It is the only way I will ever do anything holy is Christ in me. The Sabbath is an example of righteousness by faith. Ask a simple question. What made the Sabbath holy in Genesis chapter 2? God did. There's only one thing that can make anything holy. That is what God does. What God has done. What makes us holy? It God does. It is what God has done, is doing, and will do. Are you resting in what God has made holy? Are you resting in His Sabbath? Are you resting in what man has made holy? It's another day. Of course, it's not really holy because man can't make anything holy. You see, one is righteousness by faith. One is based on what God has done. One is based on what man has done. It's just like Cain and Abel. Abel brings the lamb representing Jesus. And Cain brings his own fruit, his own works. I can accept the Sabbath that God has made holy. Or I can accept a day that man has claimed to make holy. And I want to be careful. I know there are sincere Christians who are living up to the light that God has given them. Maybe doing a better job of living up to what God has given them than some of us. But I also have to be honest. You can read it from cover to cover. God never sanctified any day but Sabbath. Well, it's in honor of the resurrection. Well, if you want to honor the resurrection... I'd suggest you honor it in a biblical way. There's baptism. It represents his death, his burial, and our resurrection to new life in Christ. There is a communion service. There are ways to honor the resurrection. But the Bible doesn't ever call any of them holy, sanctified. It is only the Sabbath. Revelation chapter 14 Verses 11 and 12. That simple contrast between those who follow the beast and those who follow the lamb. Between those who truly have rest and those who will never find rest. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night who what? Worship the beast and his image. Now folks, we could talk a lot about the beast and I'm going to oversimplify it dramatically. But anything you worship that isn't Jesus is the beast. Anything I worship that is not Christ, it will never give me rest. I will find I am searching and I can never find it because there is only one who can give me rest and that is Jesus. When the smoke of their torment ascends forever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whoever received the mark of his name. And then there is the other group. There's only two groups. Those who find rest and those who will never find rest. Those who worship God and those who don't. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, I know I've said it before and I'll probably say it again. Folks, you cannot keep the commandments of God without the faith of Jesus. And you cannot have the faith of Jesus and not keep the commandments. 
because you see really the two are the same because Jesus is an embodiment of the commandments. You can't have Jesus and not have the commandments. The only way I will ever keep the commandments is to have the faith of Jesus, to be like Jesus, to have him live out his life in me. Sabbath rest is resting in what God can do and only God can do. Sabbath rest is remembering that I was created in God's image. God created you and me in his image. And God and God alone can restore that image in you and in me. May I put it very simply. Sabbath rest looks like Jesus. Because you see, Jesus is the embodiment of the Sabbath. He is the one who created it. He is the one who made it holy. He is the only one who has ever kept the Sabbath holy, always, without fail. How did Jesus keep the Sabbath holy? You know, we've talked about some of the miracles, some of the things he did. It's really very simple. What was Jesus? He went to church or the synagogue. He studied, he taught. It's a time to go and fellowship with one another in a spiritual setting. It's a time to study and to learn and to share what I have learned about Jesus. He also healed. It upset a lot of people. But he healed. It was a day that he participated in acts of mercy and kindness where he demonstrated God's love to others. I wonder, do you keep the Sabbath holy like Jesus? Jesus who made the Sabbath holy. Jesus who kept the Sabbath holy. Jesus who can make you holy. Jesus who can keep you holy. Jesus who invites you to come to him and find a Sabbath rest. Do you want to be like Jesus? Will you accept his invitation to come, to come to him? Will you allow him to restore his image in you? Will you allow him to make you like Jesus? Our gracious Father, we would ask that by your grace, by your spirit, we would enter into a Sabbath rest that rest that comes from ceasing our works and depending completely on your works, on allowing you to work in us and through us and allowing you to restore your image in us. Father, I would ask if there is some here that their hearts have become hardened, that there's unbelief in their lives, that in the quiet of this moment they would say, Lord, I want you to make me like Jesus. I want you to give me a new heart and a new spirit. And Father, for those of us that have made that decision, may we be more and more like Jesus each and every day is our prayer in his name. Amen. Shall we stand together?